Blood on the River, Jamestown, 1607, Chapter 20. Thus did they show their feats of arms, and others art and dancing. Some others us used Odin pipe, and others voices chanting. William Simons, The Proceedings. The morning we are to leave where Wokomoko, I am jittery with excitement. Na name on tack, it'll be his name and tack is too. It'll be his first time home since he went to England. He will have lots of stories to tell his people. You'll love my home, he says to me. It is, I know, I interrupt him, it is much better than my home. We both laugh. Name on tack collects the gifts he received from England, a red velvet cassock which he says is not as warm as a deerskin mantle, a pewter chalice, which he said is not as good as a gourd to drink out of, and an ivory tooth scraper, which he refuses to use because he says the Indian way of cleaning his teeth with sassafras root is much better. I gather my spoon and bowl and a water skin. We present ourselves to Captain Smith, each with a small bundle to carry. Captain Smith looks up from cleaning his musket. Samuel, where is your sword? Where is your armor? Go back and get properly attired. But I thought we were at peace with the Powhatans, I want to say. I know better than to argue with Captain Smith, so I simply go to my cabin and do as he says. At least he's not making me carry my heavy musket on the hike to where Wakokomo. When I get back to Captain Smith's cabin, the carpenter John Layden is setting out front with his tools, working on making a small wooden chest. He is carving initials into the top of the chest. He already has an A. And, as I watch, he finishes a B. Who's that for? I ask. He keeps his eyes cast down, intent on his work, and he does not answer me. And then it dawns on me. I tip my head close to his. Is it for her? I whisper. He glances at me, and I see he is afraid to tell me, afraid I will announce it, and give the other men a chance to ridicule him. I look at the small chest. It is beautifully crafted out of cherry wood, a work of love. I watch him as he begins to carve a border around the initials. John Layden is quite a man. He is sturdy and kind, and he is the only man who has decided to woo Miss Anne Burras with something other than bragging and strutting. I lean close again. She likes flowers, too, I say. He gives me a quick smile and continues his work. Captain Smith is ready to go. He carries his musket and has not one but two bandoliers of gunpowder strung across his chest. His sword hangs at his side and he is wearing full armor. He looks as if he's going into battle, not like he is visiting someone to invite them to come get some presents. This crowning of Powhatan must truly be a bad idea. There are only six of us going, Captain Smith, Naaman Tack, and three soldiers. Me, Captain Smith, Naaman Tack, and three soldiers. We hike over land for about 12 miles. When we come to the Paw Monkey River, which separates us from Werewokomoko, we find a canoe in the rushes and use it to paddle across. When we reach the other side, I see nothing but the tall, grand trees with the leaves turning red and gold. Come, says Naaman Tack. Paiqua. A worn footpath brings us into the woods, and soon I smell the smoke of cook from cook fires. Namontak breathes deeply and smiles. He is going home. We come to where the houses of Werewakomoko are gathered, straw-colored rectangular houses with curved roofs. There are at least twenty of them scattered among the trees, with gardens in between. They are about the size of ours, but made of rushes woven together. Three small boys run out to greet us. Namontak lifts the littlest one into the air. He laughs and says in Algonquin, You grew so much while I was gone. You must have eaten a whole bear. More people from the village come to see who has arrived. Captain Smith speaks with one of the elders. He tells him we have gifts for Chief Powhatan brought from England. Will the ch great chief come to Jamestown to receive his gifts? The elder says the chief Powhatan is in another village, thirty miles away. He will send for him immediately, but he will not arrive until tomorrow. I am relieved. We do not want to anger chief Powhatan quite yet. It is beginning to get dark, and the air is filled with chirping of crickets and cicadas. The elder motions for us to follow him, and he leads us to a field. Two young boys lay down mats for us to set on, and they build a fire. Are we being invited for supper? Are they about to start cooking on the fire, I wonder? We sit on the mats, and various people from the village come and sit near us. A few old men and women, many children and young warriors. They are all silent. Their faces expectant as they are waiting for something to happen. But no one brings food to cook on the fire. My stomach begins to churn. 
What is going on? What are they expecting to happen? I am glad I have my sword, but what are they going to do to us? Captain Smith sits on the mat next to me. His eyes are wary, and I know that he, too, suspects this might be a trap. I touch his sleeve. What are they doing? I whisper. Suddenly, shrieking and howling erupts from the forest. The same battle cries I heard the night James was killed. I leap to my feet and pull out my sword, ready to fight and slash. Captain Smith draws his sword. He seizes an old man sitting near us and holds the sword to his throat. Our soldiers aim their muskets into the dark forest. The howling comes closer, louder. Our attackers will be upon us at any moment. Out of the shadows, a little girl comes running. She rushes up to us and stands bravely in front of the loaded muskets. It is Pocahontas. I promise no harm will come to you, she says, holding up her hands, palms up. If I am wrong, you may kill me. Captain Smith lets go of the man. He translates what Pocahontas has said for the soldiers, and they slowly lower their muskets. All right, Captain Smith says, still looking wary. Pocahontas recognizes me and smiles. She comes to me and Captain Smith and gives us the same look of expectancy I've been seeing all evening. Just watch, she says. Then in English, she adds, you like. I grin. Captain Smith must have taught her some English words during her visits to our fort and her vi and his visits to her village. She takes our hands, pulls us both down onto our mats, and settles in between us. The fire casts a moving light. Into the firelight leaps a form. Is it a buck? I blink. It's a woman. She is wearing the horns of a buck. Another woman leaps into the light, then another and another, all dancing, shrieking their battle cries, their bodies painted white and black and red. Some wear bucks' horns on their heads, and each carries a weapon. One a club, another a sword, another a bow and arrows. The young women leap and whirl around the fire, their battle cries now mixing with the music of drums and rattles. They bring the night alive with their warrior's dance. I watch, spellbound. It is magic. The music and dancing last for at least an hour. Then the woman run off into the darkness of the forest, shrieking the same way as they came. There is a moment of hushed silence. Then everyone starts talking, laughing, with children running and playing, and everyone getting up from their mats. Pocahontas looks at me, her eyes glowing. Did you like it? She asked in Algonquin. I nodded enthusiastically. Wow, I say. This is a new Algonquin word I have learned from Namontak. Wow is their word for wonder and awe, and it is definitely the best word to describe what I have seen. I have heard about the masquerades in England with their grand costumes and music and acting, but only nobles are allowed to see them. Now I have seen a new world masquerade while sitting next to a princess. With torches lighting our way, Pocahontas leads us back to the village to one of the houses. There, the young women dancers join us, still in their costumes of body paint. They all act as if they are in love with Captain Smith and our soldiers. They crowd around them, giggling and saying in English, Love you, not me? Love you, not me? I raise my eyebrows at Pocahontas. At Pocahontas. Who teach them that, I ask? She gives me an impish look and shrugs. I smell something delicious and turn to see several older women bringing in platters of food. They are large. There are large wooden bowls of steaming beans, peas, and squash, platters of roasted fish and venison, baskets of bread and fruit. It is a feast. I eat until I can't stuff in another bite. When Namontak sees me yawning, he takes me by the shoulders and steers me toward the door. You will sleep in my house tonight, he says. Outside, the night air is brisk. But when we enter Namontak's house, it is toasty warm from a fire in the middle of the dirt floor. The smoke gathers in the high ceiling and escapes through a hole in the roof. Lining the walls, there are platforms made with poles, reed mats, and skins. I see that Namontak's brothers, the three little boys who greeted him when we arrived, are already asleep on the platforms. He points to where I will sleep, next to the smallest boy. He gives me a deerskin blanket to keep me warm. As I lie on the bed, I can still hear the talking and laughter coming from the house where the feast is going on. Namontak is right, I think. His home is much better than Jamestown. There is more food and more joy to be had in one night than in the whole year in Jamestown. Thomas Savage only stayed for a little while in Werewakomoko. Why did he not beg to be allowed to stay forever? I wish I could come here to live. 
I would learn the Algonquin language even better, and I would be able to trade and help the colony. Namantak could reach, could teach me to make a bow and arrows and to shoot straight. I could hunt and help feed us. I wonder if this is what Reverend Hunt means about making decisions out of love. Love for our newfound Indian friends. Love for our fragile new, col- new world colony. I remember when we first landed in Virginia and again the night of the Indian raid. How I thought I hated all the natives and I wanted our men to shoot them and kill them. Those thoughts seem so strange to me now that Naaman Tech has become my friend and Chief Powhatan has rescued us from cold and starvation and Princess Pocahontas has treated us to her countrymen, treated us as her countrymen. This new world is a good place to live, I think, as long as we live in peace with the Powhatan people. Then I remember how Captain Smith dressed as a warrior to bring news of the coronation to Chief Powhatan, how he said this news would not sit well with the chief. And I wonder how long the peace and the love will last.